Welcome to Between the Vines. My name is Kevin Martin. I'm here with Jennifer Phillips Russo and Andy Musa. We finally got the whole team back together uh, for another podcast. This is not a coffee pot meeting. So we did want to touch uh, sort of what we thought were the major highlights for the week um, and get an opportunity to do that a little more directly uh, since we did not have a special guest this week on the coffee pot meeting. And um, we thought this would be a good way to to keep you updated on what was going on. And I did want to talk about some stuff that's been in the news in general, inflation and how that relates to farmers and vineyard operators. Um, Jennifer? Yeah, hi everybody. Thanks, Kevin. I actually want to touch base on your crop estimation. It should be happening at 30 days post bloom. I don't know if you just want to do our brief introductions and go on to Andy and then we all yeah, talk. Yeah, yeah. All right. I think so. So I'll pass it on to Andy then. Andy Musa, I'm with the Lake Erie Regional uh, Grape Team, Extension Team, and also um, uh, with the uh, Penn State uh, Grape Team. What are you talking about today, Andy? Uh, I'm going to be talking about what um, I found in the vineyard here, uh, early scouting on Monday and Tuesday. Excellent. Um, why don't we start in order of, I guess, for, for the most part, how fast you have to do something about it. Um, so crop estimation has been, you know, since 30 days, which which was actually a couple of weeks ago, sort of a, a fast and furious, uh, you know, sampling activity over the last couple of weeks. Yes, thank you. So our lab, we actually invented with work from Coleman Technologies in Pennsylvania, the Cornell Berry County machine. So we've been using that to do quick counts of 50 cluster samples all across the belt. So we're talking from Niagara County down through following the lake shore down through Pennsylvania and even some into Ohio. We ended up analyzing 182 samples. So we kind of have a belt wide estimate of where we're going to be because you project it out 30 days post bloom times two and that should give you right around your final fresh berry weight. So if you want to kind of know where you stand and you are a member of the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program, you can look at our crop update and upcoming newsletter. There's going to be more data in there. But out of the 182 samples that we have looked at and analyzed, 54% of those samples are either nine, ton nine tons up to 20 plus tons. So nine tons or higher are 54% of those samples. We have been saying that there's a large crop out there and that you had to do basically knowing your vine size to know what your vines can handle to see what you can ripen before harvest. So this might give you a little bit of where you stand as long as you know your vine size and what your crop estimation is to help make some decisions of possibly fruit thinning, especially if you're one of those 20 plus tons per acre people, I'm pretty sure you're not going to get, the crop load is going to be outrageous if you figure that out with the Revaz index. So. <laughs> One of the concerns I would have is is not just those 20 tons per acre because our experience or your experience, the lab's experience with uh, crop estimation is in uh, vineyards we're collaborating with or in vineyards that are research vineyards. So in commercial vineyards like these that are that are a little bit more of a random sample of all commercial vineyards, you're going to see a a wider array of vine size. So it's probably just as likely that some of those nine ton vineyards are actually the most overcropped. Uh, oh, definitely. And that's gonna be a little bit more of that detail I was speaking about in the newsletter coming up at the end okay. of this week. Yeah, so, but I think just to clarify is these are completely, I would almost say random commercial vineyards. So, so you get a much better idea of overall yield but probably it's a little more opaque what that crop load is because commercial vineyards, everybody does something differently and has a different strategy, even more extreme than, uh, you know, collaborating vineyards, which tend to sort of conform to the standards of what research needs. That's how they collaborate. But um, yeah, so I think definitely something to be concerned about in terms of there's certainly some real financial risk there of, crop sizes that are that large as you know as you were saying about theorizing about the revised index yeah you don't want to drive down your vine size just make sure it's a 
something that you can handle. In the crop update, we stated, <clears throat> excuse me, you should be asking yourself some questions. You should ask where you are in your own field. Can you ripen that on the vine? Are you willing to be in that 54% vine for those scheduling loads? Do you know where your sugar is? I mean, I know there's a lot of questions you're all asking yourself, but pushing your vines just because there's, <sighs> this is hard, Kevin, because I can hear both sides. I'm, there's a viticulture side where I'm like, please don't push your vines or you're not going to have a crop next year. And then there's the other side that says, but look at where the market is for the, <laughs> for the crop this year. So there has to be some sort of in between. I just want to make sure that you have a healthy vineyard moving forward, not just because you have a large crop up there, crop out there this year. No, I think we've talked about this over the last month or so. You know, this is a great year to take on a little bit of additional risk yeah. and, and sort of the opposite of what you're saying, uh, push your vines. But in the same, I'm not trying to actually disagree with you when I say push your vines. I think what you want to do is have a really good crop estimate estimate so you know how hard you're pushing your vines exactly and you know if they've never gone for a run before don't try to make them run a marathon you know if you know if you're comfortable with eight ton to the acre year in and year out i don't think you have to thin down to eight ton this year i, I don't think anybody's saying that correct um, you know you don't have to have a revaz index of eight nine or ten or even twelve this year um, if you're growing Concords or Niagara's, but you also don't necessarily want one that's, you know, 40 or, you know, 20 ton to the acre on a relatively small vine, which is not out of the realm of possibility. So if you go out and do some sampling and that's what you find, you might want to take some sort of corrective action. Exactly. That's all. Um, I do want to so, add so this what might... is driving this because we've had hail, we've had frost. Why are these crops so large? It's just been a beautiful season to get going. Last year, we also had frost and freeze damage. Some of these crops had a little bit of rest and was able to put the resources into making this year's crop a little bit better. The conditions during fruit set were phenomenal. There was beautiful weather during there. We didn't have a heck of a lot of rain during that time. And now we do have it where we're in, where the vines actually really need it. So it's just been this perfect storm of weather conditions. The vines were rested last year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone, you know, by mid June was saying things look pretty good anecdotally, but now that we're actually measuring things, you know, is berry size looking like it's above average? Is that what's driving it or? Berry size is looking like it's above average. We do have approximately a 10% increase in berry size over last year. So okay. that is, and there are also clusters are larger. Okay. I, again, that might, that'll all be broken down. I don't have the data right in front of me to give you all of that information, but we'll give it to you in the newsletter coming up. So you're seeing both components, both of those components of yield sort of driving it. I agree. Yes. Okay. Oh, no, no, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing. I'm, I'm just asking. <laughs> I haven't yeah. taken that detailed of a look at that data. I know you shared it with me, but I'll let you handle that. So I do have a little bit of a weather issue. So this might lead into what Andy is going to talk about. But we did have some substantial hail damage in our Niagara County of New York, especially on the escarpment from what I'm hearing. I've not seen it firsthand, but I do hear that there is some sus substantial hail damage up there. So Andy, we had a question last night about, do we need to be concerned about berry damage at this point in time and botrytis or diseases coming in? Well, I, I think it depends again on um, what varieties you're growing. Uh, you know, we got uh, hail here in the Lake Erie region uh, earlier and, uh, you know, quite a few Concord and Niagara vineyards got hit. But at that time, you know, um, the berries are still green and we weren't anywhere near Verasian. So, you know, we really didn't have to worry about, um, you know, botrytis or any diseases because those berries will heal over, um, either fall off or they'll heal over. Um, what we start to worry about is, um, again, if you've got some tight clustered wine varieties. And at that time, uh, when we got that frost, I mean the hail, sorry, 
Um, that was what a couple of weeks ago, Kevin. We got that. Ours, yes. Yeah. Yes. It so, was before crop estimation. Right before the crop estimation. Um, you know, with the tight clustered wine varieties, we still worried a little bit about that because um, if you have berries that are dead, uh, and as those clusters close in, uh, they could be sites for botrytis. And then you can't get a spray in there once those uh, tight clustered wine varieties, you know, those, those clusters and berries fill in. So um, we were, we were uh, recommending that uh, at that time it was close to bunch closure. So for those varieties, we were recommending that guys put on a spray for botrytis. Um, last night, uh, a grower called, I think it was what, at the coffee pot about Pinot Noir, was it? Yes. And um, he, he had indicated that, um, you know, they already had cluster closure. And so I guess the question was, should he or should he not put something on for botrytis? Um, you know, generally, if, if you're doing botrytis sprays, if you follow the traditional four sprays, um, you would have had one on at cluster close. And then the next, the final one would have been, um, final two, I'm sorry, uh, would have been uh, at verasion and just before harvest. So the four are, you know, at bloom, cluster close, before cluster close, verasion and harvest. Uh, he was past the cluster close, but since Pinot Noir are really high value wine grape varieties, and because maybe some of those uh, berries may die, you still may get some botrytis, even if it's on the outside of those berries that don't fall off. So, you know, I did recommend uh, putting on a spray. He was going to spray anyway for all the other uh, diseases. And so I did recommend that he put something on all for botrytis. Now, that might be debatable a little bit because we still, we still are, I think, um, far enough away from verasion that those berries would have healed over. But to be cautious, uh, if any of those berries were dead and you did get botrytis colonizing those dead berries, there's a chance that um, you know you would get botrytis and because they're so close, you know, the botrytis would go from one berry to the next. So in those uh, Looser cluster varieties, we don't worry about that as much. But in these high value tight cluster varieties, um, we do worry about um, botrytis and other bunch rots getting in there. Now, Thank you. Yeah, and I think specifically it sounded like based on the coffee pot meeting that, that what Andy is talking about is not just for that individual grower, a kind of hit sort of the, the area that is for vinifera production. Not that it, you know, it is a little spread out in Niagara, but there aren't a lot of concords in that area. Um, so I would anticipate that that advice would be pretty solid advice for most of the botrytis, um, you know, sensitive varieties that are vinifera that are in that area, which honestly is gonna probably be more P Pinot Noir than I think everything else combined. In terms and of I still, I still would not have recommended for the guys that do have Concords and Niagara's up there. I still would not have recommended to put um, a fungicide on those varieties mm -hmm. either, because again, we're still far enough away that those berries will heal over or fall off. Now, I mean, hail is a spotty thing, and we did only talk to probably three Concord growers that are up in that area. But it, it sounds possible that none of the Concord Niagara production was even hit. Although at some point, I think sort of the, the rain that's been accompanying some of these hailstorms is actually going to start causing some damage or disease problems because they got, you know, I think we down in Chautauqua County and Erie County, PA have been inundated with some <laughs> seasonable amounts of rainfall and they got more than us. Uh, I don't know if their monthly totals are more than us, but, but that storm was certainly worse than, than any of ours. Maybe not all of ours combined, but um, have you well, been know, some of that in your scouting? Well, I know that uh, talking about the rainfall amounts, Kim Knappenberger um, put together a chart of uh, 26 of the newest stations across the region. And that's going to be in the, this week's crop update. And uh, what those weather stations showed, and I just went through that real quick, that um, five of those stations in the region 
uh, were between eight and nine inches. And this is from the beginning of July to now. Uh, between four of those stations had between seven and eight inches of rain. Uh, five of those stations between six and seven inches of rain. Uh, eight of those stations between five and six inches of rain. And uh, that's in three weeks, just like you said, yes, three weeks, three weeks. And then um, between three to five inches, we had, uh, I think, four stations. So we've had an incredible amount of rain uh, so far in July. So, you know, that again, once once we get into those situations, we really start to worry about uh, diseases. Um, luckily, uh, this rainfall wasn't earlier because uh, really early season rainfalls, um, you know, before bloom and continuing through bloom is uh, when we really worry about the susceptibility of those berries to uh, diseases. So that's why we always, um, we always, uh, emphasize to the growers, you know, the immediate pre and the immediate post. And then hopefully they're also getting on, you know, one or two um, early sprays of Mancozeb for, you know, diseases like Phomopsis and black rot. So um, if anything's good about this rain is, you know, we did need the rain um, up until- Some of it. Yeah, some of it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We won't off, be but... water stressed carrying these large crops. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, we were getting close. It was pretty dry, um, you know, up until that point. And now, you know, the bucket's really tipped and <laughs> we don't need any more uh, for a while. But um, so another good point, one was that, you know, the vines did need it. And then the second point is that since it occurred later in the season and a lot of our guys had gotten those sprays on, um, when it occurs later like this, they've taken care of a lot of the initial um, uh, infections and uh, there's not as much uh, concern as earlier uh, with diseases. Um, the biggest concern now is um, with downy mildew because of all that rainfall. Um, and especially on the um, susceptible varieties. I'm, not, I'm still not really worried about um, any problems in the Concord vineyards. Anybody that's been taking, you know, half decent control of their vineyards uh, still, they might, they might pop up here and there, but I don't expect uh, any major problems with the uh, Concords. Andy, I just want to interrupt you just for a quick minute, because I know that we have a couple of new growers who actually listen to this. When you say susceptible varieties, can you just elaborate a little bit for some of our newer growers who might be out there? Well, some of those uh, American varieties that, you know, like Niagara and Catawba, they would be susceptible. Uh, but then you get into, you know, the French hybrids and the viniferas. Now, um, when we talk about viniferas, there's different degrees of susceptibility, but, you know, as a blanket statement, most of those vinifera varieties are going to be, you know, pretty susceptible to downy. Um, so not all, you know, not all of them to the same degree, but sort of as, a, as just a rule of thumb, we're saying the vinifera varieties are, and, and that goes across the board with, you know, like powdery and, and the other diseases too. Um, so uh, that's what I'm talking about. And we have that chart. Um, if, if growers uh, really want to see the, the susceptibility of different varieties to the different diseases, we do have that um, table in the um, New York and Pennsylvania um, Great Pest Management recommendations. Thank you. So one of the things I noticed because of all the rainfall is that the surface temperature of Lake Erie dropped a lot. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily predictive of anything other than I jumped in the lake and it was really cold. Um, but I did go and look it up and we are about, um, we are, we were eight degrees cooler than last year as a lake oh, town. Wow. And um, the, so that's, that's measured in Buffalo, I think at the treatment plant, which is 30 feet down and you're getting close enough to the river so you get a good mix of what this that's what i was just going to ask where are they taking the sample um and i i my immediate reaction was i usually go there because it's easy to get data it's not the data that terry uses because it's it's not as good for predicting bloom which is what he's doing with 
lake temperatures. So I went and found some surface temperature data and it was in the low 60s in Dunkirk um, for a couple days because of that well, rain. All of that rain just fell. I mean, that's in some areas, eight inches that's running right off and it's cold. Yeah, and you could actually, I mean, you could use those those um, GIS images of the lake temp to find the creeks that 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 feed the lake because it was cold around those those areas. But yeah, I mean, if if there were, and I think we should we should kind of discuss this, but it, there might not be anything to it. But if there were any sort of prediction of you know that being a problematic for development of Bricks accumulation, I'm sure it wouldn't be surface temperature because that's just going to be too volatile uh, when rainfall affects it. It just, that's what made me notice it because it was not 68 degrees. It was very uncomfortable. <laughs> so it was 30 feet down is where they take those samples. And we are actually, did you say eight degrees lower than last year? Yes. Even with the hot weather that we've had in the early. Right. Huh. Right. Yep. And it's something to watch. So, so looking back historically, um, Lake Erie is much warmer in the last 20 years on average than it was prior to that. I think part of that history is is Lake Erie was very polluted, so it didn't warm up as much because it was so dark. <laughs> <laughs> the light couldn't get in, but um, it did. So it did start to warm up as it got cleaner. But in general, um, since the 80s, when you see average temperatures below 70 this time of year, those years jump out as that was a really awful year. But, um, you know, I think conditions this year were a little bit unique because most of those awful years, you also had a late bloom date. So we had an early bloom date this year. So this may be kind of an outlier in terms of data. It might not actually mean anything. It was just something I noticed. Got it. Just watch it. Um, so Andy, what anything else that you want to update in terms of vineyard scouting? I have a question, Andy, if you I'm sorry, and then I keep jumping on what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so I was in some vineyards and I have seen Japanese beetles. They are definitely out there. I thought that I saw feeding behavior of um potato leaf hopper. Is that the, now or Am I just seeing the beginnings of the Japanese beetle feeding? Because it was, you know, the tinier and the little chains. Oh, you're muted. I'm not sure. Sorry, I got a call from a grower, so I couldn't. So <laughs> I wanted to mute it because I didn't want you guys to hear the phone call. Um, well, the leafhopper feeding, what some growers might confuse with potato leafhopper. Is, is that what you were asking about potato leaf? Yes. Okay. Is um, sort of the distortion and yellow, yellowing and cupping of the leaves. Uh, you're seeing a lot of that now in the Concord vineyards, but what that is actually is caused by um, infections of uh, powdery mildew on the younger leaves. So usually on the, on the leaves uh, more towards the uh, end of the shoot now, you're seeing that cupping and distortion yellowing the leaf. And that's actually caused by powdery mildew infection. But it could be confused with, um, with uh, potato leaf hopper feeding because potato leaf hopper feeding, um, they sort of inject a toxin when they feed. And that causes that cupping and yellowing of the leaves from potato leaf hopper. Uh, right. So, yeah. So Are you seeing it as well? The powdery no. mildew that powdery mildew, uh, the cupping of the leaves from powdery mildew. Yeah, there's a lot of that now. And, and that happens every year. Um, and generally, you know, I don't think that that is much of a concern um, for the degree of powdery mildew in the vineyard. Um, mainly you look at the, the whole canopy, I do anyway. And um, the canopy looks generally pretty good. I mean, I would say low to moderate levels actually in most of the canopy. It's just those ends of the shoots that are starting to get those, you know, leaves that are cuppy. Uh, so um, again, when you talk about should growers spray now again for powdery mildew, um, 
you know, Brian had has, has mentioned in the last couple of crop updates that, um, you know, there is no formula. We don't have any formula saying, okay, this much powdery mildew on Concords, you need to, you know, keep spraying. Uh, what it's really going to depend on is crop size. Crop size, what these guys have, they have really, you know, above average or really heavy crops, you know, and you talked about that already with some of the size of the crops. Um, and uh, it's going to depend on the crop size and also on, you know, what weather, what types of weather we get from here on in through harvest. Um, you know, generally, if you have a um, heavy crop size and you also have pretty crummy weather like uh, overclass, overcast cloudy weather, which is bad for ripening as you, you know, get towards harvest. And then um, that those types of conditions, cloudy, overcast, uh, high humidity or good for powdery mildew. So you have all three of those combinations um, that, uh, especially like I said, if you have a high crop size that can um, really affect the uh, ripening. But again, this is in, in above average to very heavy crop vineyards. Uh, generally, if you have an average crop uh, on Concord and you know the season's decent, you don't generally have to worry about powdery mildew that much it's not like um it's not like uh, some of the wine grape varieties where you have to continue to spray so you're really going to have to gauge um how clean you want to keep the leaves um and that would again relate to your crop size so uh so i can't give you know that's a roundabout way of saying i really can't tell a grower yes you have to spray um you just have to do it block by block uh the other thing we're seeing we did mention downy um, that we're worried about. Um, again, uh, it would be the susceptible varieties. I, I really didn't find any out there in, and I was out in Fredonia's, Niagara's, uh, Delaware, and there's some of the varieties that are susceptible and, and in Concord vineyards, I didn't find any any downy mildew, but I got reports from growers that they were finding some downy in some of their Niagara blocks, in some of their um, Catawba blocks and wine variety blocks. So uh, can you hear, um, can you hear You're that? You're a popular man, oh. yeah. <laughs> okay, that's again, as a grower, do you want me to mute so that? Uh... Sure. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Our growers are important. <laughs> so, I thought you were talking about, um, and we don't really need to talk about it because it's not this time of year, but um, grape leaf hop hopper, not potato. Um, no, I really thought it was potato leaf hopper. So you haven't seen any grape leaf hopper? Okay. Not that I'm aware of. I, was... I, I have, and I'll try and get rid of this phone here. I, uh, <laughs> I have um, seen it. Uh, starting to build up in a couple of vineyard blocks. And um, it, it's not to the point where I'd say, you know, a grower needs to spray, but it is building up and there's both um, adults and nymphs that are in the vineyard now. So they are starting to feed. So, you know, if growers are out there, you know, uh, lift up the canopy, look at the uh, leaves inside the canopy more or less uh, some of the basil leaves and see if there's any um, stippling. It's like uh, little white pinpoint um, marks on the uh, upper surface of the leaf. And that indicates that there's a uh, leaf hopper feeding. And as the populations build up, as soon as you open that canopy, shake the leaves, you can see the adults flying around. And, uh, you know, uh, that's indicator that they're really starting to build. Um, Again, generally, we don't, at least in Concords, they can take a, quite a bit of uh, leafhopper feeding. Uh, it's only in years, and, and uh, Tim Martinson had done some research uh, years ago uh, that it, it's Yeah, only... I was going to say 1991. Okay, so I guess that was, oh. <laughs> you, guys <don't, laughs> you guys don't remember that, but I do. <laughs> and uh, what Tim found was that um, in Concords, uh, again, they can take a lot of leafhopper feeding. It's only in years, the hot, dry years, where we have uh, very heavy crops that we have to worry about, you know, the leafhopper feed uh, affecting um, 
some yields or sugar. So the other thing is, which is why I said, you don't even really need to talk about this now is <laughs> most of the time, if those populations build up early enough, you'll reach those thresholds because you know there's less leaves plus the season's longer, so they'll continue to build. You'll reach the thresholds he established um, and have to put on a treatment, but typically that's in June or July. Uh, so we'd already be past it. Not that it can't happen. You know, if you were overcropped, it looks like the threshold is um, 10 per leaf. So pretty unusual, but not impossible to see those levels. And it, I, it does seem like when he was doing this work and also about four years ago in the Hanover Silver Creek area, there were probably probably 20 growers that time. I don't remember 1991, but he mentioned it was similar in that there were local areas where it would build up every year over and over again. And eventually, I think the same thing happened when the price of grapes went up and people tried new insecticides, they kind of just wiped them out. And we haven't seen that problem in that area be widespread since then. But for years it was, I don't know if they're they're great flyers, if that's why. So if your neighbor doesn't take care of them, you end up getting them or your neighbor's neighbor. But that's, I mean, their, their presence was there for probably about five years. And I think it was related to some poor insecticides. Well, the other thing is, you know, years and years ago, and I'm talking, you know, even before Tim Martins, I mean, when the grape industry years ago, leafhopper was a huge problem, um, you know, across the whole belt. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and again, you had to figure when, when people were picking by hand, uh, you know, when those leaf hoppers are flying out and flying up your nose and everything else. I mean, there were just, you know, really tons of them. And that was a problem. And, and you also had to consider at that time, you know, we didn't have the canopies that we did now. So, um, you know, there's less leaf area. So now, you know, our canopies are, are pretty big. Um, so they could take even more uh, feeding injury. The other thing is they're, they're not that difficult to control. I mean, and for instance, if you're putting on some sprays, uh, for the, uh, second generation of berry moth, say in July, beginning in July, um, a lot of our guys are using pyrethroids or, and, and that will knock them down. And, and they really, really are not that difficult to control. But like you said, it's over, I haven't seen a, a real region-wide problem with uh, grape leaf hopper in quite a while. But like you pointed out, Kevin, there are areas where they will flare up or even, even certain vineyard blocks, you know, I've seen them and you go to the next block and there's hardly anything. So Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly what Tim Martinson highlighted too. You know, you look and see 80% of the vineyard sites don't have a problem. And then you've got one or two sites that are 10 times the threshold. I'm exaggerating a little bit. I think it was five, but, but in Hanover, they were definitely closer to 10 times. And I think those are essentially no spray trials that you were looking at in Hanover. There weren't any insecticides being applied when you got to those levels. Um, right. And, and, you know, in those situations, you know, definitely would warrant a spray, but, but like I said, I haven't seen a problem where it would be generally most growers should be applying a, a an, insect, an insecticide for leafhopper. I just haven't seen where the, the levels have been that bad. So it, it's more again on a block by block basis. But they yeah. still have to be out there scouting. Yeah, yeah, because when you see it, I think you could see why before the era of insecticides it was a huge problem because once they do build up, if you can't do anything about it, you could see where they do some real damage. But but yeah, it you like know, it, and by that it, time, like you said, now. If, if growers aren't out there by that time, when those numbers have built up that high, and if you have a heavy crop, you know, by that time, they'd be too late. Yes. Yeah, I think so. I think there was a recommendation for a late August spray if you reach if you eventually reach that higher threshold of 10 instead of five. Um, but I'm assuming that was for the following season to try to keep the population down, not for any benefit at harvest. But I don't know. That would be my thought, you know, because the real recommendation was to do it in June or July to prevent the damage in the first place. 
with and, a lower and threshold. Generally, you know, if you're getting those populations that early, right, then you're definitely going to have you know problems because it's going to continue to 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 build, and plus, you know, that's from June on feeding in the vineyard. If nothing's done, uh, it really does take a toll. But again, uh, usually it's if you're going to have a problem in Concords, it's it's uh, hot, dry years, heavy crop, and um, especially if they come on early. So um, one of the things I do want to touch on while we have just a couple more minutes is inflation. Uh, it's been in the news recently. I had a grower, you know, ask about it, you know, in terms of what it means. And, uh, you know, I think there's some concern that that it's kind of a devastating thing. And so hearing about it is is very worrisome. But but what I would say is, you know, inflation is going to be a bad thing if it gets away from a level of control and it's more like runaway inflation. It, it will, you know, the fear, the things that people fear are true. Um, you know, the economy will operate less efficiently on both a micro and macro level. So, so to bring that down to the vineyard, that means relative to your, your ability to buy things, probably what's going to decrease the most is the equity you have in your farm. So it becomes very difficult to, to grow and consolidate farms because interest rates are up. Um, the cost of inputs are up and it's very difficult to plan. So just because Roundup is $19 a gallon, that's not necessar necessarily a bad thing. The real scary part is you don't know, you have to put that Roundup on and buy that Roundup before you know what the price of grapes are. And, and you also have to figure out a way to pay for that Roundup before you get the extra money from the grapes. Because if we're talking about inflation, we're talking about the price of all goods going up, which would include grapes it, and it may not you know all goods may not go up the same amount which is also which is another thing that presents itself as a challenge so it's not that the 19 dollars roundup is bad because you can't afford 19 dollars roundup because that's just too expensive it's it's the planning that goes into trying to figure out as to whether or not it's justifiable which has been really easy for us because we haven't had that inflation so we know we have a rough idea of what we're going to get paid for grapes over a long-term average. We know, you know, a rough idea of what chemicals cost. We can say, you know, in December, what it's going to cost to put on Roundup in August. If you have spiraling inflation, you can't make any of those business assumptions. So you have a lot more financial risk. And what that means is not only are, are interest rates directly higher, it's also harder to get access to that capital because you can't go to a bank and say, I can buy this farm and make money because you don't know, because you don't know where prices are going to go. Um, so there, so there are there is some real risk there, and and the sharp, the sharpest risk is probably the equity you have in your land. So you know what a grower really needs to do is to right size their farm when they can, you know, and what that means right now is you need to limit your exposure to inflation risk. So you should be moving debt to things that are secured uh, on the value of your best collateral, which is probably land or real estate, and getting fixed interest rate debt. Uh, you should be right-sizing your farm as soon as possible, because if you try to grow your farm during a period of runaway inflation, it's just too inefficient. Um, you know, particularly if you're growing fast enough so that you have to finance the cost of inputs, that's very problematic. Um, Typically, financing the cost of inputs is going to be a variable rate loan. So you, you can see what the problem would be. Uh, and then if inflation slows down and you don't get anticipated increases in price for one reason or another, or there's a, a weather-related disaster, the risks that are always associated with farming are just greater and carry more zeros. And that's, that's the problem associated with growing during periods of inflation. Now... So it's horrible, potentially, but you have to have two things for inflation. You have to have buyers who expect there to be inflation. So it's usually consumers. It doesn't have to be consumers. It can be producers, but they all buy things. They have to be willing to pay more for these things. And the only way that's going to happen is if they think prices are going to continue to rise. So, you know, I went and looked at a, a flight and it was $600 to fly to Texas. And I used to think that 
I don't know, $250 was a steal of a deal, especially if it was direct. $300 was, was good. Well, I don't necessarily think that prices are going to continue to rise forever. So, you know, a, a flight is a little bit of a different thing, but certainly if that were a car, I would probably just wait unless I really needed a car. And so then buying slows down. Now, if I think my $20,000 car is going to be $30,000 in two years and $60,000 in four years, I'm going to run out to buy this car that is suddenly more expensive. I'm going to rush to do it. So when that expectation changes, that's when that's a key ingredient for actual inflation. The other thing you need is money. So I want to run out and buy this $20,000 car that just doubled in price because I'm worried it's going to double again. Well, if I don't have $20,000, I can't do that. And, and this is a macroeconomic issue. Like just because I have money doesn't mean everybody does. So what that means is the people who are most likely to spend money either have to have more or be more willing to part with what they have. Um, and some of those factors are true. Like some of those things are, 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 have changed recently, which create inflationary pressure. So um, during COVID, we've had um, the savers rate. So the amount people save went nuts, like historically off the charts, crazy. Um, you know, the whole idea that, you know, the greatest generation save money and the young kids don't was kind of turned upside down. And, and it was not limited to young people or old people or whatever. Everybody saved a whole bunch of money. And the only people who didn't were basically the unemployed. Everybody was terrified and they saved a bunch of money. Well, they, they have that money if they want to, if their expectations change, they can spend that money. Um, the other big factor is the government borrowed a bunch of money and gave it to people who are very likely to spend it. The unemployed, farmers, um, the middle class and the poor. They were recipients of uh, you know, financial stimulus that started in the early 2000s as a response to, to economic decline. Only the experiment here was much larger dollar amounts. So, you know, People might remember back in 2007, everyone got like $500. And usually the joke was like, it cost more to write this check than it than the check was worth because a lot of people didn't get the full amount kind of thing. This was not that. This was, you know, people were getting thousands of dollars. Lots of people were getting thousands of dollars. So that cash, some of it is still available. I, I think the unemployed did a very good job of stimulating the economy. They took that money and spent it. And there's a lot of data out there to support that. But they gave it to everybody who wasn't wealthy. So that's part of the reason that savers rate is so high. So this was unexpected money that people are typically a little more willing to part with unexpected money. So, so that's definitely creates some inflationary pressure. Um, I think COVID-19 is really what you're resting your, you know, your sort of basis on if, if you really think inflation is going to be a thing. So we haven't had severe inflation since 1981. Inflation has not ever been a problem since 1981. So most people in their working lives, not their not their life, but their working life, don't know what inflation is. They don't remember it. They never earned a dollar and saw it sort of disappear because of inflation. Um, you know, unless you started working before 1980. And and those you know there are people out there that exist you know, for sure that started working before 1980. It was only 40 years ago but they're not a majority of the economy anymore. So, so I think what it would take to get people who, um, you know, who are working, who have access to, to more capital, um, to get them to change their expectations, it would take a major event. And maybe COVID-19 is that major event. Um, you know, we were raised in a society that prices just never went up. There were technological developments, there was competition. Prices just never, ever went up. They haven't in 40 years. So it's hard to change that expectation. And that needs to happen or there just won't be inflation. There might be a recession or something, but there, there won't be inflation. So are you saying holding off on purchasing and growing bigger for a little bit? No, I'm saying plan it and do it carefully because, you know, if you really need to do it, then it has to be done now or it could be 10 years before you could do it again. Um, I think people who have a long window, um, you know, if, if you have 30 years where you think you're gonna own this land that you're purchasing, that lowers your risk because the value of equity you have in that land is less important. 
if you're purchasing land to grow towards the end of your career, which sometimes a lot of people do to make room for, you know, it suddenly becomes a three family farm instead of a two family farm or something like that before, you know, before somebody retires and then it's a two family farm again. Um, there are some real financial risks there because if there is a plan to sell some of that land in the next 10 or 12 years, I would say that's a financial risk that you should probably consider. And anything that you're doing now should, it's probably best practice to finance it with, um, and with fixed rate financing. And if you don't have access to fixed rate, um, there is going to be a little bit of heightened risk from variable rate. But, you know, all this being said, like we had a major event that could change expectations. We had, um, we have extra money churning in the economy. It's still been 40 years without severe inflation. We have, you know, the news media talking a lot about inflation um, based on two months of data. So we need way more than two months of data to really know that inflation is a problem. Right. Even the two months of data that we have don't show runaway inflation unless you draw the curve as like, well, it was 0% a couple months ago and now it's five. So if I assume it's 10 in a couple months, if that's the trend line, then yes, we have runaway inflation. But if the trend line is just we went from zero and now we're at five and we stay at five or go back to three, you know, we just don't have enough data to know that this is to come anywhere near close to knowing that this is going to be a problem. So uh, it, it does make sense to certainly pay attention to it and not overextend yourself too much. You know, what I wouldn't do is take my 80 acre farm and make it 190 acres and be completely leveraged in that investment. So I don't even have the money to cover uh, input costs and I have to borrow against my crop every year to do that. That that would be the kind of activity I would avoid right now, just as a hedge in case. I would just stay, you know, maybe I go from 80 acres to 100 acres and I would well, stand up. You're scaring me now that everyone's like, oh, there's a big crop out there. Let's just hang as much as we can because we're going to need this money coming up. Right, right. No, that's, yeah, I mean, getting a bunch of money is, you know, from a big crop is a good way to add flexibility because, you know, I can say things like shift your debt to fixed rate. That's a solution. Well, you may actually need some cash to be able to make moves like that. And we'll be in a much better position if we have a good crop and we can actually do some of those things. Um, you know, if you're you just don't drive down, you're your strapped and overextended, some of these options are just theoretical and there's nothing you can do about it. So, and again, a lot of people have made a lot of money ignoring a risk for, of inflation for a long time because there hasn't been any in 40 years. So, you know, take a look at this data, continue to be the farmer that you are and continue to take on as much risk as you're comfortable with. Because if you take on no risk, we could go 40 years without any inflation again. And then what? <laughs> but, but the one thing I do want to emphasize is the cost of an individual good or service does not create inflation. And there's there are a few economists that disagree with this point, but I'm a big fan of it. Um, I don't care how expensive the price of fuel gets, even if it's $10 a gallon. That's not inflation. It's never inflation. Unless people have more money and they think the price of other goods and services are going to go up, you might see more expensive fuel, but you won't see inflation. Um, because people will just spend their money on fuel and save it on something else. So a lot of times you see downward price pressure on other goods. And we've seen that for the last 30 years, specifically related to usually fuel. Um, other things get cheaper because fuel gets more expensive. And yes, things that are highly related to fuel sometimes get more expensive. Like we can't afford to get the jet off the ground unless you give us more money for fuel. But, but it doesn't make sushi more expensive. Like it, it just doesn't because people don't have the money to spend more on sushi because they didn't get it from anywhere. And then nobody changed their mind, changes their mindset because they never see people trying to raise the cost of other goods or services because, you know, they know it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But if, if you get these other ingredients, then you can get inflation. So, you know, we'll see. Certainly watch it and pay attention to it, especially if you're thinking about doing anything different with your business. But even if you're not, it's worth paying attention to. I've put Andy to sleep. <laughs> <laughs>
<sighs> well, thank you for that. We have almost been having this podcast go for an hour long today. Well, thank you all for joining us. Hopefully you have an hour to listen to it, even if you're not sitting on your tractor spraying for an hour, because hopefully the scouting took care of it for you and you don't have to do that. But we'll be back next week. Um, not sure what format yet, whether it's a coffee pot. We do have a few of those left and we'll continue to air some of those for you if we if we think they're worthwhile. And we'll also continue to join you this way. So thanks for joining us. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. And this is, we are the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program and this was Between the Vines. Thank you.